Hey everybody, welcome back to our next YouTube lesson. This lesson is going to be all on the properties of solids. We touched on this a little bit in Chem 1 and even in Chem 2, but your AP exam deals a lot with the properties of solids. And that's just something that you really should know anyway based on the different types of bonds and intermolecular forces. So depending on the type of bond that a compound has, and depending on the types of intramolecular forces those compounds have, that's the type of solid that you're going to have. And those solids are going to have very different properties depending on the bond type and also the intramolecular forces. So of course, we already talked about a few of these things already. So we talked about the types of bonds and those are called intramolecular forces. That word intra means the bonds that hold molecules together. So they're the bonds within one molecule. And there are ionic bonds, there are covalent bonds, and there are also metallic bonds. We also talked about intermolecular forces. So intermolecular forces are within different molecules. So if you have very good interpersonal skills, that means that you're very good at communicating and talking with other people. So inter means with different things. So it's the force of attraction between different molecules or between different substances. So there's five that we talked about in class. So there's lenten dispersion, dipole induced dipole, dipole dipole, dipole ion, and then hydrogen bonding. Um, and those intramolecular forces and these types of bonds, the intramolecular forces, are really what tells us the type of solid, solid that something is going to be and the properties that it's going to have. So here's just an example of the difference between inter versus intramolecular forces. Of course, intra is going to be the bond that's holding together the single diatomic chlorine in this case. So the single molecule is Cl2. Um, that nonpolar covalent bond is the intramolecular force. It's holding together the two atoms in that single molecule. However, there are slight forces of attraction between the different Cl2 molecules. So one Cl2 molecule has a slight attraction for another Cl2 molecule. And that slight attraction that's between them is an intermolecular force. In this case, it would be a London dispersion force because Cl2, of course, is a nonpolar molecule with no dipole moment. Let's go ahead and talk about these four different types of solids. And I think the first two are very easy because, of course, those types of solids are going to contain those types of bonds. So there's ionic solids, there's metallic solids, there's covalent network solids and then molecular solids. Covalent network solids and molecular solids both contain covalent bonds, but the difference is what holds together the molecules within that structure. So let's take a second and talk about ionic solids first. So this is a really cool ionic structure. So actually one of the first things you should know about ionic solids is that they are crystalline in structure. So just like this one here, they're going to look like crystals. If you're into um, crystals or rocks and minerals, like I am, I love, love rocks. I actually have some behind me in this cabinet that you can't really see. Oh wait, I'll pull it out. So I actually have this crystal that was behind me in this cabinet. Um, now this is probably covalent network actually. Um, just because this is a piece of quartz, but a lot of crystalline solids do look something like this, and they are comprised of um, ionic materials. So here's one. So I just went around my house and I grabbed a bunch of my rocks because I'm really excited. So this one is amethyst. So this one also has a crystalline structure. So this has some ionic properties about it as well. Um, I'm actually not sure what the chemical makeup of amethyst is, but I do know this next one. This is a giant piece of pyrite. So this is iron sulfide. This is beautiful, but this is really an ionic solid. Um, really, really cool. And then I have this little tiny piece of citrine as well. So you can see that it has this crystalline structure as well. So, and I don't believe anything 
I don't think they're going to bring me good vibes or anything. I just like to look at them. Anyway, let's get to the, the properties of ionic solids. I could talk about my rocks all day. So like we said, these are very, these are crystalline in nature. So they're very orderly arrangements. And the reason why they form these very orderly arrangements is because the atoms want to, of course, minimize their electron repulsions. So if I especially have chloride ions in salt that all have a negative charge, they wanna be surrounded by positively charged cations or sodium ions. Therefore, they're going to arrange themselves in a way that they're going to perfectly arrange themselves um, with cations and anions in the perfect amount. So they form these very orderly arrangements and thus you're going to have very crystalline structures. So this one right here, um, you can see has a very crystalline structure as well. So that's because the atoms that make up these up are very, very orderly. And that's why you're going to see with something like this, um, they have these like really defined shapes to them. These crystals actually grow in a specific ratio. And that's because of the way the atoms form um, and the way that their crystal lattice looks, which is really, really cool. So the image up here is halite. So this is just table salt, which I think I've talked about before. Also, what you'll find with these is that they're very brittle. So actually, when I grabbed this one, I was nervous because I heard a little crack. Yeah, it was actually moving. So you could see right here. I don't know if you could see it, actually, but this little piece is moving. I might be able to pull it out. No, I don't. It's, it's moving, definitely, but I don't want to pull it out. So these are also very brittle. And the reason for that is because they have these orderly arrangements. If you take them and you crack them down with a hammer, the plane of atoms move. And when the planes of atoms move, you have positively charged cations next to each other and you also have anions next to each other. So when I look at this image right here in the center, you take something and you crack it, or this just happened to crack when I picked it up before. Um, you drop it, let's say, you're applying some sort of a stress to that. And when that happens, you'll notice that the positively charged or the same charge ions end up next to each other. And when they end up next to each other, they repel each other. And therefore, they'll actually split or they'll cleave. It's what it's called. So these form uh, really nice cleaved surfaces, which is why when you crack an ionic crystal, a lot of times it will crack in that same exact shape is because it cr uh, cleaves along a flat plane, you'll see here. So you can cleave right along here. Once the similarly charged ions line up next to each other, they repel, positives repel positives, negatives repel negatives. They're no longer attracted to one another and therefore they repel. So if I drop this on the floor, this will break. I will be very upset. I would be super upset if I dropped this one. <laughs> Um, but this one will also crack. And same thing with these other ones as well. So this one might crack a little bit, but I, I believe this is quartz and quartz is covalent network. So I don't want to use that one as an example too much here. Now, all of these you're going to find are not, they're not going to follow all of the properties of ionic solids. And that's because some of them might have a little bit of covalent nature. It's not going to be clear cut one or clear cut another, but they could have properties of both and that's okay. Ionic solids also have low vapor pressure, high melting points and very high boiling points. And that's because of that crystal lattice structure again. The positives and negatives attract each other. So I could see here, this cation is perfectly surrounded by all these anions. This anion is perfectly surrounded by all of those cations there. It's very difficult to break them apart because the positives and negatives attract. And we call that electrostatic attraction because of that very high electrostatic attraction. It's very difficult to separate those ions from one another. Therefore, it takes a lot of energy to melt them and it takes a lot of energy to especially boil them. Vapor pressure just means how fast it evaporates. So if you have water on the counter, let's say, over time, that water is going to very slowly evaporate. And that rate at which it evaporates exerts some sort of a pressure on the atmosphere above it. 
I don't have any water near me, but I would show you that if I could. So you have a glass of water and at a specific temperature, those water molecules are evaporating. And probably at this temperature we're at right here, vapor pressure is gonna be pretty low. You're not going to have a lot of water evaporating. If you heat up a sample of water, however, the vapor pressure is going to increase and that's because it's going to boil very readily. These guys here, they're not going to have a very high vapor pressure because the particles are attracted to one another very, very closely. They're not going to want to boil. I can't take this and melt it on the stove very easily because the particles are highly attracted to one another, those cat cations and anions. And um, they're not going to want to melt, nor are they gonna to wanna to boil for sure. So I can't take ionic solids and melt them for that reason. These particles are very attracted to each other. Ionic compounds are also soluble in water. Now this is one where these are not going to dissolve, so they're going to have some covalent properties about them. But if you have a pure ionic crystal like salt, let's say, salt will dissolve in water. That's because it's comprised of um, highly electronegative anions and cations with a very low ionization energy. So they transfer that one electron really easily. These ones don't transfer that one electron very easily. So they're not going to follow um, the complete ionic properties that we see. But very strong ionic compounds will in fact dissolve in water. It's interesting because they're not going to melt and they're not going to boil and they're not going to exert a high vapor pressure because those particles are highly attracted to one another. However, when you introduce a polar solvent like water, water has a dipole moment. So part one side of the water molecule has that partial negative charge. And the other side of the water molecule has that partial positive charge. Therefore, water molecules can separate the ions in an ionic crystal, which we can see here very nicely. So here's a crystal of sodium chloride, perfect ionic structure. I have a water molecule. The negative sides of water that have the partial negative charge will attract the cations, the sodium cations, whereas your positively charged hydrogen atoms in polar water will dissociate, we should say, the chloride anion. This is how ionic crystals dissolve. It's all because of the dipoles and it's all because of those positive and negative charges that water has. So here's a really nice animation. Now, I can't take credit for this. I did not make this, but um, it's really, really cool. So here's a little salt crystal down here, and we have our water molecules. And of course, water in the liquid phase, they're going to vibrate back and forth, and they're also going to translate. And translate just means that they would slide past each other. So just imagine like this water molecule is able to slide over here. This one's able to go over here. They can move past each other. These water molecules, once you introduce an ionic compound, what's going to happen is the negative sides of water, so the oxygen side, can attract the sodium ions off of the crystal, just like that. Other water molecules nearby will arrange themselves in a way to minimize electron repulsion, and therefore that cation is totally dissociated. The same thing is going to happen with your chloride anions. So here, Notice the positively charged sides of water or the hydrogens will arrange themselves around the chloride anion. Other water molecules will, will follow suit and they will arrange themselves in a way, again, to minimize electron repulsion. The positive sides of water will surround the negatively charged ions. And this is going to happen until either A, you run out of salt, or B, you run out of water. So you'll find that either all of your salt's going to dissolve and you'll have some water left, or you're going to have some salt left over at the bottom of the beaker. And that's because there's not enough water molecules to totally solvate, is what it's called, or to totally hydrate um, the, ion the ions in the salt crystal. So this will just keep on going. So pretty neat that water can dissociate a lot of very ionic solids. Not so much these, but, and the reason why not these is because these are made up of transition metals. So transition metals are not as 
um, they don't act as ionic as like your alkali metals and your alkaline earth metals do. So here's another example. Um, we can see here the water molecules, you introduce a salt. Slowly, what's going to happen is that crystal is going to shrink because the water molecules are going to pull the ions apart from the crystal until, of course, either A, like we said, all of the salt is dissolved, or B, until there's no more water molecules left. Notice here how the water molecules arrange themselves beautifully around those ions. So this would be your anion with your positive charges of water or your hydrogen surrounding that. And here I have my cation with, of course, my negative um, oxygen, my negatively charged oxygens around surrounding that. It's a lot of talking for ionic. The other ones are not this long, I promise. Ionic compounds also conduct electricity in the liquid state. They actually do not conduct in the solid state. And that's because the ions are fixed. They don't move. Because the ions and the electrons, therefore, are not moving at all, you can't conduct electricity when I have an ionic solid in its solid state. So if I had a giant piece of salt, and if I were to try to conduct electricity through that, through that it's not going to happen. And that's because those ions are fixed in place. However, when I heat up a sample of sodium chloride and I turn it to a it's liquid state of matter, we get that additional translational energy. And therefore, your electrons can, can flow throughout that material. Your ions can move, your electrons can move a little bit better. Therefore, ionic liquids will conduct. Ionic solids will not because the electrons are not moving. However, when it's in its liquid state, that translational energy allows them to slide past each other. And therefore, you will see liquid ionic solids conduct or liquid ionic materials conduct. Also, ionic solids will conduct electricity when they're dissolved. And again, it's because of those positive and negative charges. So when I have salt that's dissolved, those positive and negative charges can move throughout the material. So if I take a look at this last picture, for example, these ions aren't stuck in one place. They can move throughout the solution. And because they can move, that leads to a solution to conduct very, very easily. This is why you'll see um, like lemons or potatoes being able to conduct very well. That's because you have some ionic solids in there in the, what they're dissolved and electrons are able to flow through that. And that's because you have ions that aren't fixed in place. Let's talk about metallic solids. So like I said, the ionic solids was a little long winded. Um, the next ones won't be so much. Metallic solids are neat. And I know I showed you guys this, this video before, um, but this I think is a really good example of why this happens. So metallic solids, we said, are really good conductors of heat and electricity. And that's because of those metallic bonds. So you're not gonna watch this whole video here. Um, I started it at the 13 second mark, I believe. But those electrons, are always moving throughout those overlapping electron clouds. So here would be my potassium ions. We have these electron clouds that are overlapping and the electrons are moving throughout. Therefore, just like we saw with ionic materials, if those electrons and those ions can move, it conducts. The same thing goes with metallic solids. If we can move or if those electrons can move throughout that material, it will conduct um, and it will conduct very, very well. So your metals are awesome conductors of heat and electricity. That's why a lot of your wires contain copper metal. So, oh, my microphone here, I'm trying to show, I don't know why I'm trying to show you a wire like you've never seen one before, but um, all of your wires have copper inside of them. Um, if you ever have like an iPhone charger and if you, you're, you're using it too much and you see the ends start to fray, you could see the tiny bits of copper on the inside. And that's because copper is an awesome conductor of heat and electricity, and it's relatively cheap compared to some other ones. Metals are also malleable and ductile. Malleable means that we can hammer them flat down into a pancake, and ductile means you can pull it into a wire. The reason for that is because when you take a metal and you smack it, those atoms or those ions can move 
but the electron clouds move with them. Because the electron clouds move with them, the atoms slide past each other very easily, and therefore they'll take the shape of whatever without breaking any bonds. So you can take something like these pieces of jewelry, let's say, and if you wanted, this is sterling silver, you can bend this into a different shape and you can do that because the, um, the atoms can slide past each other very, very easily. So that's why a lot of jewelers can take rings and make them larger or smaller. Like this ring's actually a little small for me. I would love to get this made bigger. Um, and the reason why they can do that is because those metallic atoms can slide past each other very easily without breaking any bonds. The electrons move with them, which is really nice. So those are the major properties about metallic solids are really that they conduct electricity very well, heat and electricity, and the fact that they're malleable and ductile. They have variable melting points because it kind of depends on the metal. Covalent network solids, really interesting. These are made up of all non-metals. So I should have said that before. Of course, ionic solids will be comprised of metals and non-metals because they're going to have ionic bonds. Metallic solids will contain just metals. That also includes alloys in there. Covalent network solids will contain just non-metals. But the difference between covalent network versus molecular is that you have to have a giant network of bonds. You have to have essentially giant molecules. So these particular types of compounds are going to have a very high melting points and very high boiling points. And there's really not too many examples of covalent network solids. Some of the best examples are like diamonds. So like the diamond in here as a covalent network solid. Quartz, which I believe this is quartz, would be a covalent network solid as well. Silicon carbide, which you find in a lot of computer chips. So that's SIC. And then graphite. So graphite and pencils is also a covalent uh, network solid. And these have very high melting points and very high boiling points. And that's because you have almost every single atom in that structure is covalently bonded to another atom. So if I look at diamond here, for example, all of these are carbon atoms and every carbon atom is tetrahedrally bonded to other carbon atoms. Therefore, if you have a diamond, it's essentially one giant molecule because every single carbon atom is bonded to other carbon atoms, which I always think is really, really cool. This is one big molecule. Um, so you can see at the bottom, all atoms, and these only involve nonmetals, are covalently bonded in a 3D or a 2D structure. So graphite is another one, but graphite has really different properties. Both of them are comprised of just carbon, but rather than carbon atoms sp3 hybridized to one another and forming that tetrahedral shape, graphite actually form oops graphite actually forms in these sp3 or sp2 hybridized so they form in a planar structure and because they're planar when you write with a piece of graphite it actually breaks off into little sheets so when you write with a pencil like this person did on my thing um you'll see that those are basically little oh, wrong thing there those are basically little tiny um, sheets of graphite that are left on the paper. And the difference between that and the diamond is that the in between these sheets, you have pretty weak intermolecular forces, which is why they'll, they'll break off very easily. Um, silicon dioxide is essentially glass or it is sand on the beach. So different sizes of them makes them behave a little bit differently. Uh, but silicon dioxide, that all those little bits of sand, those little bits of quartz on the beach, they're basically giant molecules because every single silicon and oxygen atom is covalently bonded to one another in one huge structure. And also your covalent network solids, for the most part, with the exception of graphite, are very rigid and hard. 
So if I have my ring again here, I can't take this and form this into another shape. It's very, very rigid. It's going to keep its structure. And it's also very, very hard. In fact, diamonds are one of the hardest materials on earth, if not the hardest. The only thing that could scratch a diamond is another diamond. And um, that's because their bond angles are fixed. I can't move them. So unlike ionic solids, where you can kind of break them and crack them, because they cleave along those planes and unlike metallic solids where the bonds move with them these ones they can't move and because they're covalently bonded along all four sides of that they're going to be very very strong same thing with silicon dioxide it will wear and tear over time but it takes a very long time for it to um, erode down into very very small sand pieces these are also insoluble in most solvents, and that's because we don't have any charged particles here. So luckily for many people, diamonds aren't just going to dissociate in water. They're not going to dissolve. There's no charged particles. I would infer that if it would dissolve, then diamonds would not be nearly as expensive as they are. But um, because there's no charged particles in any of these, it makes it very difficult to dissolve them. You can get silicon dioxide to etch from nitric acid, but that's, I mean, that doesn't happen very readily. Plus nobody has nitric acid, just kind of, or not nitric acid, I'm sorry, hydrofluoric acid. Nobody has hydrofluoric acid like laying around somewhere. Let's talk about molecular solids. So most of your materials that you're familiar with will be molecular solids. And the difference between molecular versus covalent network is that your covalent network solids are, like we said, essentially one giant molecule. You have this 3D arrangement of all of these covalent bonds over and over and over again. If you're networking, you're making those connections between everybody and everything. Molecular solids are, they're not networking in that way. Usually you're going to have very small molecules or not small, but smaller than your covalent network. And the type of molecular solid all depends on the intermolecular forces. And I don't even like to say solid with these because you're going to find that most of these are not solids. In fact, some of them are gases, some of them are even liquids. Some of them are solids, but they'll melt at a much lower temperature. So some examples of molecular solids, neon, and again, it's not a solid, but it is molecular. Uh, carbon, I'm sorry, um, carbon tetrachloride right here, vitamin C made up of all non-metals. So I have these covalent bonds, but it's not one whole network of covalent bonds. I have benzene down here, sulfur dioxide, and ethanol. The major difference is that we have different vitamin C molecules or different sulfur dioxide molecules. And rather than those different molecules being covalently bonded to one another, they're attracted by intermolecular forces. So here is an example of methane or CH4. Here's a CH4 molecule, here's another CH4 molecule, and you'll see a whole bunch of these CH4 molecules. We have covalent bonds, those intramolecular forces that are holding together the carbon and hydrogen in the one molecule. However, there's very weak forces of attraction between the different molecules. So what's holding together one CH4 molecule to another CH4 molecule? Well, CH4 is nonpolar, therefore London dispersion forces very, very easy to break apart those London dispersion forces. Therefore, your molecular solids or molecular compounds are going to have very low melting points. It's very easy to separate different molecules from one another. And that's why you're going to see many of them are in fact gases at room temperature. Some of them, you can get them to melt at room temperature. And that's because the, there's intramolecular forces that are holding those molecules together and they're very weak in comparison to the other types of bonds that we've seen. We also, you're going to see a little bit of a discrepancy between polar versus nonpolar molecular solids. And in this case, we're going to talk about the solubility of nonpolar solids. 
This would be an example of oil and water, let's say. So oil is a nonpolar, again, solid. It's just a nonpolar material. I guess you can think about coconut oil because um, that's typically kind of like a solid. If you take coconut oil and you try to dissolve it in water, it's not going to dissolve. And that's because they have different intermolecular forces. Oil, if it's nonpolar, only exhibits London dispersion forces, whereas water molecules like to hydrogen bond to one another. Therefore, water molecules are not going to mix with the oil because they don't have similar intermolecular forces. The water molecules are literally not attracted to the oil and therefore they're going to stay separated. So you could see that with actually iodine in water and iodine in carbon tetrachloride. Iodine is nonpolar and water is very polar. So because I have a nonpolar molecular solid dissolving in water, they're not going to mix. Nonpolar materials will not mix with polar materials because they don't have similar intermolecular forces. Iodine can, however, dissolve in carbon tetrachloride, and that's because both of those are nonpolar. There's a golden rule in chemistry, like dissolves like. So because iodine and carbon tetrachloride have similar intermolecular forces, they like to be near each other, as opposed to iodine and water will do not like to be near each other. You'll also see polymers as well, and you might have talked a little bit about polymers in AP Bio, I'm not sure. Um, but sometimes, especially with very long chains of um, carbohydrates or your very long chains of molecules you've talked about in AP Bio, sometimes they might have a very polar side and sometimes they might have a very nonpolar side um, because of that or a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail. You might have heard of that before. Um, and that's because one side of the molecule is polar and the other side of the molecule is nonpolar. So you can have very large molecules where sometimes some of it will dissolve and some of it won't. That's actually how soap works, which maybe I'll have a lab for us to do for that. But that's how soap works and gets the, the dirt and grime off. So you can also have these really long polymers that exist as well. And these are also molecular solids. So they're not small like carbon dioxide or sulfur dioxide or methane, whatever, um, but they're still going to be considered molecular because they will have attractions to other nearby long chain molecules. Um, these sound pretty scary. So hexamethylene diamine reacts with adipic acid and produces nylon. So this is essentially one big giant molecular solid. In this case, polymers will be solid. Higher molecular weight compounds tend to have much higher melting points. And we could see each of these trends with, um, with the different types of materials. So covalent network by far has the highest melting point and highest boiling points. So, and that's because you have those network of covalent bonds. Every single atom has a covalent bond to another set of four atoms or another set of three atoms, which makes it very difficult to break them. Ionic materials, um, metals bonded to non-metals. So those electrostatic attractions are really, really strong and it's very difficult to separate them just by melting. So therefore these guys will have very significant, will have much significantly higher melting points. Notice how magnesium fluoride has a higher melting point than sodium chloride. That's because um, both of these two atoms, magnesium and fluorine, are much smaller than sodium and chlorine. But also, magnesium has a positive two charge. So think about Coulomb's law. If that nucleus has a much stronger pull, it's got a more positive nucleus, it's able to attract those fluorines more so, therefore it's harder to break them. It has higher lattice energy or a higher melting point. Metallic kind of varies. Um, covalent molecular or nonpolar um, does not require that much energy to 
melt them. In this case, a lot of times they are gases to begin with at room temperature. And that's because they primarily exist to blunt and dispersion forces. That's what's holding those different molecules together. Does not take a lot of energy to break them. Whereas covalent molecular polar does take significantly more energy. That's because in these two examples, you have to break hydrogen bonds. Water molecules are attracted to other nearby water molecules via hydrogen bonds, and therefore takes a lot of energy to break those. You'll notice the melting point of water is significantly higher than the melting of ammonia, the melting point of ammonia. Even though they both can hydrogen bond, water is much more polar because it has two lone pairs. So um, it takes a lot more energy to vaporize that. Really quickly, overview of the types of solids. So molecular solids are comprised of atoms or molecules. What's holding those atoms or molecules together? Intermolecular forces of attraction, your hydrogen bonds, your uh, dipole-dipole bonds, your London dispersion. Some examples would be very small molecules, neon, water, carbon dioxide, lots of other examples you can think of. Metallic solids, their structural units, what makes them up are positively charged metal atoms. What's holding together those positively charged metal atoms? Well, your delocalized sea of electrons, those electrons that are constantly moving. That's what's holding together those positively charged metal atoms like in that video I showed. Essentially, any sample of a metal is going to be a metallic solid. And again, your alloys are in there as well. So like steel, your alloy of iron and carbon would make metallic solid. Ionic solids are positive and negatively charged ions or charged particles. What's holding together those charged particles are electrostatic attractions, the, facts that positive, the fact that positives and negatives attract one another. An example would be any combination of metal and nonmetal. Your most ionic solids are going to be between your groups one and two metals and your halogens and your chalcogens, which are the groups without with um, oxygen in there. So cesium chloride, sodium chloride, zinc sulfide, magnesium oxide, any one of those. You could have some transition metals in there, but that's when you form things like this, which they have some ionic properties, but also some molecular properties as well. And then there's covalent network, which are atoms held together by that network of covalent bonds and very, very small class of compounds. These are going to be like just your carbon in your diamonds or your graphite pencil, silicon carbide like in computer chips or silicon dioxide like in quartz. Those are the different types of solids. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. I hope you liked seeing some of my mineral collection. These are just some of the ones that I have around my house because I have a lot. Um, as always, if you have any questions, let me know, and I will see you in the next video on the ideal gas law. Bye.